Good evening. Nice to see a full room. This is the first time I've done anything for Bradley, but I've been working with the man for about four years. So I thought, with two days to go before I take off on my next adventure, I thought it was about time I came in and talked to you a lot about um, life before the best job in the world, um, how it carried me through to Queensland, how I found my Australian wife here in Brisbane, um, and how we're now about to head off and embark on a life adventure together. And I suppose my journey with social media, ever since day one, when I believed it was Storkbook, and now how I try and use it to engage an audience and to keep people in touch with what I'm doing, which I like the one at the bottom, lover of the great outdoors. That's what I like doing. I like getting outside. That's why the Southern Hemisphere has become home for me because for four months of every year in the UK, if anyone's been there and done the winter, it's a bit soul destroying and I couldn't do that. So I moved to South Africa for six years and then I got the best job in the world and I came to live here in Brisbane and this is the best climate in the world apart from maybe the last three weeks with the humidity with broken air conditioning at home. It's been beautiful. So this is, I'm afraid I'm trying to cram into 30 minutes, 10 years of adventures and life experiences and junctions that I've come to in life where I go, do I take the easy route and say no or do I take the difficult route and go, let's go and have an adventure and see what turns up. Life, for me, is all about these things. It can be all about boxes. You think about it, you get up in the morning out of bed, you walk into the kitchen, you open a box of cereal, you tip the cereal out. You finish that, you, with your bleary eyes, you get into the car, your little box, you drive to work, you get to the office, that's another box. You go to university, you sit in another box when you do your study, and at the end of your life, you get put in a box, and you get buried underground. But for me, life, is about being big and round and not fitting into a box. I've always had this problem where I've never really fitted into what I do. And that's the same for me with my education because I didn't do very well at school. I didn't do that well at college. University was a bit of a bind. I even decided when I did my first presentation to go back and get mum to scan some of my old school reports, which is always a good way to see what the person was really about. Um, at, present, at present, Ben's concentration span seems to be shrinking rather than growing. <laughs> Consequently, his pieces of work are rather short. I promise you, my wife will tell you, I have not changed today. I can't concentrate on one thing for more than 10 minutes. And sometimes it's a benefit, sometimes it's a real pain in the arse. I like this one. Um, ben enjoys topic work and has produced some satisfactory work, although loss of interest resulted in a carelessly finished cover on his book of Australia. I was eight years old at that stage, so this teacher, Mrs. Martin, who features in my book and was the best teacher I ever had, I sent her a copy of my book, honestly, this morning, it went in the post to her in England, I want to tell her about me finishing my chapter about Australia. <laughs> okay, so this is just what I did at school. I wasn't the best, mum wasn't very proud, I had to have no E numbers in my diet, you know the E numbers you have in orange squash and stuff, because I'm a little bit hyperactive and the E numbers just jack that up a gear or two. So I had to stop that sort of thing. Um, so where did I get this idea of having an adventurous life and where did it all come from? Well, mum and dad are obviously a big shining light in everybody's lives. It's great to have them, it's great to go on school holidays with them, but every year they used to take us on the same trip from the south of England in the car with the caravan on the back to the north of Scotland, which is sometimes in the middle of winter a, a problematic place to go on holiday. In the middle of summer, for some reason, it's even more so. And this is the sort of things we were greeted with. The Scottish Highlands in all their glory. So this gave me a sense of adventure. It also gave me a love of the great outdoors. Because the west coast of Scotland is one of the most beautiful places in the world. It is stunning. And we went for long walks across the hills. We'd sit in a little boat and fish for mackerel. But it gave me a love of what life is all about. I then, after finishing school, got to college. I just about scraped through my A-levels in university. I got to university and I decided I was going to study automotive systems engineering. I love technical things. I love fiddling with cars. My first car was a 50-pound Volkswagen Beetle from a field in Wales. Dad and I did it up in the garage. I drove it around for a year. It was my greatest car that I ever had, a bright red classic 1972 Volkswagen Beetle. I then got to university, and university for me was difficult. I got through my two years at university, and I got to the end of the second year, and I really wasn't enjoying it. And I can remember breaking down in the driveway with mum and going, I just cannot finish my third year. I'm really not enjoying it. I was in floods of tears, and she said, Ben, you've got another three months to go till you finish this course. Concentrate, focus, and see if you can get through. And it was the first 
question I had in life really. Do I decide to carry on with my university degree knowing that I probably wouldn't use an automotive engineering degree at all? How many people have studied a degree that they do nothing with today in their workplace? Good. There's a few of us out there. I now have a 1986 Land Rover. My automotive engineering degree does have its uses with an old British classic, I can tell you. But I decided I'd get through those three months and I did. I got to the end of the university, I had my Bachelor of Science degree and believe it or not, this is me on the left hand side with the long hair, not this one on the right hand side. Looked almost identical to my sister, and that was me on my final, I don't know why there's almost a tear mark in the picture, it's like mum said, God, it's so embarrassing with that long hair. But I'd got through, and I'd done university, and I'd taken on that first challenge in life, which was really going through the motions of proving you can apply yourself for a fixed period of time to come out with a qualification. But I had no, de no idea what I wanted to do, and up came this job working for a champagne company who sponsored the Round the World Yacht Race, and the cricket at Lords and the horse racing at Ascot, and the tennis at Wimbledon, and this job was in PR. And I thought, I've never done PR, and it was an ex-girlfriend who'd got me the job and said, come and work with us, you'll love it, it's the outdoors, it's between May and September in England. So I did that, and it was fantastic. It was one of the best jobs that I have ever had. It was hanging around with the hoi polloi of the social world, it was giving away champagne, everyone was your friend. And I love this job, and at the end of the summer, the first summer, the owner of the company turned around to me and said, Ben, you've done really well, we like the way you work in PR, would you like to go to South Africa and work for us at the Round the World Yacht Race? And all of a sudden, I had the opportunity to go somewhere else apart from Scotland for my travels. I was going to South Africa, I had heard about it, I'd read about it, I was a little fearful, and so was Mum. But I got to South Africa and with the money I earned in three months there, I sat down at the end of it and said, what can I do now? What's next? And I travelled through South Africa for six months and I fell in love with the country and the people and the continent. It is one of the most incredible places I've ever been to. And I continue to go back to Africa for my inspiration because I think it's one of the most beautiful places you can go. And in that time when I was in South Africa, I thought, well, this is getting short now, the money, I need to go back to England. And for the next four years, I swapped Southern Hemisphere summer and Northern Hemisphere summer. I went back to England to earn the money to go and spend it back in South Africa. And I kept doing it, but I wasn't really going anywhere. I wasn't really advancing my career. In 2000, there was a total solar eclipse. Now, did anyone witness the solar eclipse in Cairns about 18 months ago? Has anyone seen a full solar eclipse? Get yourself to one if you haven't. It's one of the most belittling experiences as a human being on this planet. To see the sun move behind the moon and turn everything to darkness, for me, was an incredible idea. I'd seen one in England in August 1999, and when the next one cropped up in Botswana in the year 2000, I said to my best friend Owen, why don't we hire a four-wheel drive and drive from South Africa up to Botswana and go and see it? And Owen said, yeah, why not? This is Owen, my mission partner, who you'll learn a little bit more about later. We got our four-wheel drive, we drove up there, and we got to Mozambique, um, to Botswana, and we were camped here in the middle of the plains on the edge of the Savuti Channel. There was wildlife all around. We watched totality happen for three minutes. All of the birds went to roost. All of the lions and elephants sat down for three minutes. And then the other horizon illuminated with sunrise, and everything got up and carried on and we'd sat there and watched another eclipse. We turned around and I said to Owen, what do we do now? And he said, well, let's make a promise. Wherever the next solar eclipse is in the world, we will be there. So I said, okay, let's go home and research it. And we did, a year later, by chance, there was another total solar eclipse, but this time in Mozambique. So we said, let's go back to that one. So again, we went back to South Africa, we hired a four wheel drive and we drove to the banks of the Zambezi River to watch it with a group of locals. It was a mad experience, shall we say, because it was in the middle of the floods in Mozambique, the Red Cross ring control, so there were refugee camps everywhere, and we'd arrive with cameras and pieces of welding glass to witness this astronomical experience. The locals thought we were mad, but what we'd just done is had another overland adventure. Owen and I went back to England and we said, we're not going to the next eclipse, it's in Antarctica. It's too expensive, we can't go and do it, so what do we do to continue this love of travel in Africa? And Owen and I sat down and we got out a map. And I'd always had this love of Africa and I wanted to explore more than just the South. We'd been here so far, so we sat down and said, how about we create an expedition, a project to drive around Africa to raise money for some charities? How can we do that? Now Owen likes climbing and I like running. So I said, well, I challenge you to come and run a marathon with me somewhere in Africa. And he said, well, I'll challenge you to climb the highest mountain in Africa, Kilimanjaro. 
And we thought, well, that sounds good, but we've got a, maybe a year to drive around the whole thing. How about we go and do five marathons and five mountains in that year? So we had 10 challenges. And we sat down for three years to save money and plan and get the idea together. We got to 2007 and we had two weeks to go until we were due to leave. I bought myself a bright yellow Land Rover. I called it Colonel Mustard. We had a tent on the roof for the bedroom. We built an office in the front of it. We had a kitchen in the back. And with two weeks to go, Owen decided that he was going to pull out on the expedition. He hadn't put his wheels in motion to finish off the business he was running in London. He decided he couldn't come and join me. And he'd come six months later to join me in South Africa. And it was another one of those decisions. Another one of those moments in life where I go, well, what do I do? Do I decide I'm going to stay at home and just tick over normal life back in the UK? Or do I have a bit of a challenge and continue through life? This is just a, a little picture of myself and my slightly larger friend Owen, who I dragged through the London Marathon. I can tell you now he dragged me up some mountains training for this. And this was us a month before doing all our PR shots, primed and ready to go to Africa. How did I know that two weeks later Owen was going to turn around and pull out? I set off on the 27th of December 2007 and I headed off to Africa. Deepest, darkest Africa. I got to Morocco. I got up the first couple of mountains. I got up Mount Tubkal. I did the Marrakesh Marathon. And I, and I was sending emails to going, you are missing out on the best experience. You would not believe how good this is. And he was cursing me with emails and responses. And he was saying, I'll be there. I'll come and meet you. I promise you I'll catch up for the second half. This was what I wanted to go to Africa for. The iconic images that you have. The red, red sunsets. The wildlife of Africa in Namibia and the experiences to get up close and personal to some of the wildlife. Now throughout Afrotrex, which I'd spent a year doing, I managed to get through every single one of those challenges. The only one I couldn't was the Victoria Falls Marathon in Zimbabwe. And that's because Robert Mugabe didn't really like the British in 2008, so he decided he wasn't going to give anyone visas. So I had no option but to think, how am I going to find myself one more challenge so I've got my 10? These are some of the images of finishing. So this was the top of um, Mount Tubkal in Morocco. This is the end of the Comrades Marathon in South Africa. And for some reason I decided to do a double marathon. That's a, that's a 90 kilometre one, just to make it a little bit tougher. And this was in uh, Marrakesh again. And this was the start of a life that I didn't realise was going to lead me to the best job in the world and what I'm doing now with adventure and social media. This was my first little Panasonic Toughbook computer. Rugged, dustproof, shockproof, and my window to the world. I could use it to see my route on the GPS, I could use it to write blogs and really keep a diary of where I was. I decided that back in the UK I was going to run a website because mum and dad were more than happy if I was to leave to go around Africa with Owen, but by myself they thought it's a little bit dangerous. So I said, well look, how about I run a website and run a blog all about my adventure and you can follow me and so can our aunties and so can a few friends. So I set up afrotrex.com and this was my first ever website. It, still looks pretty good now, but it, it was very, very basic. So this was the platform that I was using. Google had a platform called Blogger, and it was really the first days of people sharing their stories online. And at the end of every day, when I'd driven from one country into another and gone through a border and had an experience or done some training, I'd write down my experiences of the day and I'd put them in my diary. I didn't realise it was going to make up half of this book, to be honest with you at the time. But this was really the first avenue of social media. In those days, there simply weren't Instagrams. Facebook was in its very, very early days. Twitter hadn't arrived. So this was the first way of really sharing your story with a digital audience. And it started off with 50 people following my blog. I was really pleased with that. I got friends and family involved. And throughout the course of the year, it went on. And people started to share the story. And they started to say, oh, have you been following Ben's website? It's quite interesting what he's doing. By the end of the year, there were 2,000 people following it. All of a sudden, I was building up, I suppose, a digital audience. There was no such thing as engagement in those days. People didn't put comments on there. They just, you could just see your analytics. You could see that people were watching it. But there was no voice. There was no communication that we've got today. Twitter allows you to talk to some of the biggest stars in the world. And if they're listening and you're on message, they'll respond to you. And it's such a nice opportunity to get inside big people's lives. At the end of that year, after I'd finished those 10 challenges, I got back to the UK and it was January the 1st, 2009. If you've been in the UK in January, the day after New Year's, it's pretty cold, it's pretty dark. And I got back with a massive vacuum in my life because for five years 
I'd planned, for three years I'd saved, and for one year I'd executed the best year I was ever going to have in my life. Driving around Africa was over. What on earth was I going to do next? Nine days later, an advert went out in a national newspaper, the Daily Mail. And I thought, well, this sounds too good to be true. And my auntie emailed me from Spain and sent me the advert. And a friend sent me a picture on her phone from London and said, Ben, have you seen the advert? And I said, I have. I don't know what it really involves. So I went onto the website and I had a look through. And lo and behold, it was a desert island in the middle of the Australian Great Barrier Reef. Now, you've probably all been to Hamilton Island. It doesn't look like this, obviously. <laughs> but when it's January the 1st or January the 9th, in the middle of winter in the UK, anything with sunshine, blue ocean, looks enticing and you want to go there and do it. So I looked through and I started thinking about the application. It said, well, you need to be able to have an adventure for six months and you need to be able to document that adventure using social media. And I'd just been in Africa doing exactly that. I'd spent one year telling my story to a small audience, sharing the photos, sharing the videos and really having an adventure that people around the world wanted to follow. And that's what Tourism Queensland wanted. They were using it as the best promotional tool there's ever been to make people jealous. That jealous that they'd go there and book a flight themselves to the Whit Sundays or to Queensland from overseas and they'd come here and have that experience. And Best Job was all about that. So all of a sudden I had to ramp up my social media. Suddenly there was this new thing called Twitter and everybody that was applying seemed to be using it. They were all talking about it. The online digital chit chat was on YouTube, it was on something called Ning in those days, a social media network that really doesn't see the light of day these days. This is my first ever tweet. Pure, blatant PR advertising. Vote for me. Get on there. That's all I needed to do. Um, this was the platform Ning. This was my blog, which I'd suddenly converted from being Africa to all about Australia. I had to research and learn about what the Great Barrier Reef was all about, because in geography I wasn't paying that much attention. <laughs> I knew it was a big strip of coral up the Queensland coast, but I didn't know that much about it. So I started to research and learn and find out about Australia and share my learnings through my Facebook page and through my Twitter page. And slowly but surely, it got down from 34,684 people to the final 15. Final 16, I should say, 15 others. Tourism Queensland were very clever with this. You have to appreciate how clever they were because there was a little bit of demographic involved in the decision on the final 16 because they wanted to keep the key tourist markets around the world that supply Queensland with travellers interested. And to do that, they had to keep the national media in each of those countries interested. So all of the TV stations, all of the radio stations and newspapers that were covering the best job in the world had to stay involved if there was someone from their country involved. So we've got New Zealand, Canada, France, Singapore, Germany, Holland, England, China, Australia, Japan, America, Ireland, Korea, India, and Taiwan. So maybe it wasn't that fair, the final, but it meant that when we got to the final, there were 60 film crews from all around the world there covering it. Tourism Queensland's CEO at the time, Anthony Hayes, had a smile from here to here because he'd invested $1.8 million in an international campaign that at that stage was raising over $200 million worth of PR value. It was a great, great sell and he was just sitting there rubbing his hands together. The minister at the time, Peter Lawler, was very happy with his work and he had 16 people who couldn't do enough to sell the story of Queensland through their social media. 100% free advertising. And that there is my favourite moment in the world and the hairs at the back of the neck go up and you go, oh my God. Anna Bly turned around and said, Ben Southall, the island caretaker. And all of a sudden my mind exploded because I'd been in a Land Rover living in a roof tent on top of it for the last year and all of a sudden I was going to be living in a three and a half million dollar villa on Hamilton Island and all I had to do was travel and blog about it. It was the best and biggest moment of my life but then for the next 48 hours that followed it was the busiest ever job in the world and that continued for six months. Not only was there social media to do and blogs to write but all of a sudden all of those 60 film crews just wanted to know why the hell I'd got the job and what it, was, what it was that made me special. So there was an unofficial world record set in those next 10, 10 days, sorry, two days, of 125 back-to-back -back media interviews. So those 15 other finalists were having a big celebration party on Hamilton Island, and I could hear it going on in the background as they had three cameras lined up, basically saying, now this is the Australian audience, and we dealt with the project in seven, nine, and 10, and now England's waking up, so we're gonna do all of the breakfast shows in the UK, and now America's waking up, and now the West Coast of America is waking up. So for two days, we sat there giving interviews going, yes, it is the best job in the world. But 
I would never deny any of it because it was full of the most incredible experiences around the Whit Sundays. And all I had to do was write a weekly blog. That's what they'd said in the job description. Well, they wanted a little bit more than that at the end of the day because they were going to pay me handsomely and I was going to spend time on Hamilton Island. They wanted me to use social media to its full advantage. So using all of the mediums that I could to tell the story of what I'd just done in that day. So at 10 o'clock in the evening, when the day was over, that's when my day was really starting as well. Because then I'd have to sit down and work out how I'd write a blog that wasn't just a sales pitch, it was about a real person's experience traveling around the islands of Queensland, using whatever methods I could. So I was out there with a little compact camera in Africa doing videos and photos. All of a sudden I had to think bigger than that. I had to use good quality equipment, using things like Flickr to upload them to. Every night I'd get home and put my video together into a video editing package and try and make a decent video. I was working till three or four, probably two or three nights a week trying to get everything up onto the website to keep people happy. And it was great because Hamilton Island has got fantastic reception if you live on top of the hill, but my villa down at the bottom of the hill had one bar of Telstra reception so for the first two weeks of the best job in the world, I was getting complaints, I was posting nothing. I was sitting on top of One Tree Hill with my laptop and my dongle plugged in at three in the morning trying to upload blogs. <laughs> Quite an experience. So where was the challenge in that? Was there really any challenge in the best job in the world? Well, the whole thing for me was keeping another digital platform going. Utilising a blog, social media, telling the story through Twitter, sharing everything through Flickr. And they told me what they say once a week was the job description. Except those other 34,684 other people who hadn't got the job were suddenly taking to Twitter to complain that Ben wasn't doing enough work. And then of course the media picked up on that, so there we are, the Daily Telegraph in the UK decided that I wasn't blogging enough. So all of a sudden I had to pick my shoes up, my socks up, and get on with it. Because Anthony Hayes was happy, but the public weren't. So I had to suddenly rack it up a gear or two and produce four blogs a week now, um, there was no pay rise, obviously, there was no change in circumstance, but it meant that I was really thrown into the public eye for the first time to realise that um, you almost live by the sword, you die by the sword, and if you don't do enough work, someone's going to pick you up on it. That was my challenge. But the one that really resonated with me was when Mum phoned me one night, it was morning in the UK, and she said, Ben, I've just seen the thing in the Daily Telegraph, I'm really proud with what you're writing, and that makes me happy. And that made me really happy, because ultimately, Yes, I was there to tell the story of Queensland and Australia, but if you make your mum happy, you're doing a pretty good job at the end of it. That was one of my challenges. Six months went by very, very quickly. It was an amazing experience from travelling up in the Torres Strait to diving with the sharks and the whales and the Great Barrier Reef, travelling inland to Mount Isa, doing all these different experiences that Queensland had on offer. And all the time I was selling the story of Queensland to the world through social media. We actually filmed a six-part documentary for National Geographic Adventure Channel at the same time. So whilst this whole blogging thing was going on, there was a film crew there for probably 60% of it. That went out to 140 different countries in the world, 114 countries in the world, and was translated into 25 different languages. So there was lots going on. The best job in the world genuinely was the busiest job in the world from every angle that we did it. And it got to the end and Anthony Hayes said, well, what do you want to do next? Where do we go from here? If we just let it drop off the cliff, we're losing out on opportunity. And I said, well, I loved Africa. I loved the marathons, I loved the mountains, but I've never done an expedition on water. So how about something like the best expedition in the world? How about I take a kayak and I kayak all the way up the Great Barrier Reef? And Anthony Hayes said, yeah, that sounds good. We'll give you a few tins of beans. We'll give you a camera and you head off. We'll see you in six months. Come back with the photos. And I said, well, I want it to be a bit bigger than that. How about we get a support boat and we bring out media from all around the world because I'd been reading in the international media that the Great Barrier Reef was dead and dying and coral bleaching was killing it and there was nothing left to see for tourists. And what I'd seen during Best Job was the opposite of that. I'd seen places where there were impacts from tourism but I'd also seen incredible, beautiful places on the Barrier Reef. So I wanted to take a real person snapshot of the reef and we took a catamaran, a support boat, we took a Hobie kayak and we went all the way up the coast, living the life through social media once again. We had a live tracker on the kayak, and every single one of these little green dots was a blog post, or a photo, or a video. So you could see what was going on there and then on the Great Barrier Reef. It wasn't oversaturated photos that make it look amazing, and when you arrive it's brown and dead. It was a real person's story, exactly as best job had been, of what you'd find when you came to Queensland.
And throughout the whole journey, it took four months to retrace Captain Cook's route all the way from um, the town of 1770 up to Cooktown. It took four months to do it, and by the time we got to the end of it, we'd had about 40 different film crews and journalists come out from all different parts of the world to come and continue to tell the story of Queensland, what they'd seen on the reef, the experiences they had, the places they dived. And we took two guys with us, a guy called Christoph and a guy called Richard, who were pretty innovative in their field. They run a company in Sydney called Underwater Earth. And Underwater Earth was all about doing that, telling a story of what was happening in Sydney Harbour. All of the life you could find there on the doorstep, under the ferries. And they took some little scooters and they put some cameras in the end and they were filming underwater and it was one of the first times that people had really seen beautiful imagery underwater in Sydney Harbour. They then took this to a whole new level a year later and Google signed them up. And all of a sudden, Google Street View became Google Underwater. And you can now go onto Google Maps and you can click on Heron Island or Lady Elliot and you can look literally at 30 or 40 different dive sites and virtual swim them. This was a great little spin-off that we had from Best Expedition. These guys turned around and said, we want to make this the platform that we learn on. So they came on the boat, they brought all their gear with them, they tested it there, and then a year later, they teamed up with the big boys and Google suddenly have got massive publicity for Queensland on a whole new level. And again, Anthony Hayes was smiling because if you can virtual dive on January the 1st when it's cold in the winter in England on the Great Barrier Reef, more than likely you're going to book your ticket and you're going to come out and do it in real life. So that was the best expedition in the world. That was the end of 2011. So at this stage I was starting to think, okay, there's going to be a vacuum after this. How do you fill the gap? What do you do? What's the next challenge? And I'd worked with Tourism Australia because they took the best job in the world campaign and reignited it and called it the best jobs in the world. So all of a sudden all of the other states in Australia decided we like what they've done with that. Let's get our own jobs. So they had Chief Funster in Sydney. They had Wildlife Caretaker in South Australia. They had Taste Master in WA. All of a sudden seven people were coming across to do what I consider to be my job. Can't do it as well, surely. No, anyway. So they came across, seven people came and did it, and I worked with Tourism Australia pushing that campaign. But at the same time, I said, Tourism Australia, you don't do much with your mountains in Australia. And to be honest, they're not iconic. They're not huge. But they are spread far and wide across this great land. There are eight different states, one territory in there, eight different states that have got eight different mountains. How about we have a world record attempt. How about we go and try and run up the tallest mountain in each state in Australia in 10 days? And they said, well, if you can film a documentary and you can publicise some of the parts of Australia that we don't, because they focus on the Great Barrier Reef, they focus on Sydney Harbour, and they focus on Uluru. And there's people that go and tick them off, and over the course of nine years, they'll do the nine great walks, and they're beautiful, iconic places. So we contacted Tourism New Zealand, and we said, we've got an idea. How about we film a documentary that gets aired on TV here in Australia so that your audience can see exactly why the Great Walks are so amazing and they can come and try and do it themselves. And they said, we love it, but we're spending lots of money on The Hobbit at the moment, so we can't give you much. <laughs> okay, well, how about we come over and set the record? We'll put together the documentary. You can tell us if you think it's good enough or not. So in November, last year, we went out and did this, um, the nine Great Walks, all 545 kilometres in nine days. And it was the most brutal and exhausting thing I have ever done in my life, and I've done a few of them. Um, we started off on the South Island. Stuart, Stuart Island just sits off the bottom of the South Island. And we started off with the Rakarura track there, 32 kilometres. And over the next nine days, we made our way through all of the Great Walks until we got to the final one, um, Lake Wakaramona, which is 44 kilometres long. And we did that and finished with 40 minutes to spare on the nine days. We were literally 40 minutes short of hitting the 10th day. And we had a documentary team that followed us around for the start and the end. They didn't do the whole thing. And we got together a one-hour documentary that is about to, later this year, go on to Channel 72 over here, that basically showcases the diversity of New Zealand. So this is, these are two days apart. This is the Abel Tasman. And this is, uh, oh my God, I can't even think, the Rootburn track. So two days apart, total diversity. And the entire time we were doing this, again, we were telling the story through social media. Instagram is a fantastic way to share images, to inspire people, and tourism departments have really picked up on it now as a great way to sell a package. And this is what we were doing the whole time. We had mainly 3G reception where we were going so we could share our story, and people were asking us, they were saying, you know, is it great? Do you really want to go and do it in that many days? Never attempt to do a great walk, <laughs> any of them, in a day. It's the worst way to do the Great Walks of New Zealand because everyone is iconic for a reason. 
because it is beautiful and you can spend four hours walking and then six hours in the hut, you can meet some nice people, you can have some dinner. Don't try and run 78 kilometers up and down hill in a day because it breaks you as a person. So challenges keep coming. That was November. I met my wife in 2010 when I was emceeing the Tourism Awards and the Whit Sundays and Sophie, God bless her, she's travelled a bit around Australia and a little bit of America and she said to me, Ben, we, I haven't been travelling, I'd like to go travelling, how can we do it? <laughs> and I thought, well, I do it in a Land Rover with a roof tent, is my wife going to be up for this? So I've had to make conversions to the Colonel Mustard, I've had to put, and this is genuine, an interior vanity mirror in. I've also had to put a handle on the Land Rover so she can pull herself up into it. I call it vaginising my vehicle. <laughs> Colonel Mustard at the moment is in a shipping container on his way to Singapore. Oh, I've got to show you that, sorry, that's the social media. So that's how we told our story for the Global Adventurers. It's taking it up another level. So Afrotrex was all about blogging and simple text and a diary and it's got so much more now. So we've got a collection of short videos, one produced every day to show people how good the great walks are. Instagram obviously is huge, we've got sponsors involved, we fed all the sponsors loads of photos and images of what we were doing with them and that was our Global Adventurers brand now suddenly going across this. So Aussie 8 and New Zealand 9 were under the global brand that we created for the Global Adventurers. So we're always finding something else to do on the planet. And we got to the end of that one and Luke said, how do you think about the Tibetan 10? Um, we're not doing the Tibetan 10. All of us have said we're not running anymore, we're going to do something different, maybe mountain bikes or a slow paddle down a river but there's no race selling involved at all. I've had 31 minutes, I've got to wrap it up here. Um, tomorrow is my last day in Australia for the rest of the year, because Sophie and I are going to meet Colonel Mustard, who's currently just off Fremantle, according to the boat tracker, in a container heading to Singapore. And we're going to go and drive from Singapore back to London. So it's going to take us 10 months. We're going to go through some pretty dangerous countries, I think, on the way. We're starting off down here in Singapore, we're heading up through Southeast Asia, we're going to find people who love life. In Queensland, when I was doing the best job, so many people said to me, yeah mate, you think you've got the best job in the world, I've got the best job in the world. And I mean it, helicopter pilots and dive masters and cooks that turned around and said they loved their life and they had a smile on their face from the moment they got out of bed. And Sophie loves to inquire about subcultures and she loves to find out about people and what makes them tick. So I said, well, why don't we go and try and find the people around the planet who love their life and what gives them that passion for life? Let's find out what gives people the quality to give them the best life in the world, whether it's family or friends or money, or is it simply a roof over their heads? I saw something on the BBC website this week and it was, there was a, a village in India that have just had their first ever electric refrigerator delivered. The guy that was interviewed that had bought the refrigerator was smiling from ear to ear because he knew that his wife wasn't going to have to cook for them every single day they could store food. To go and find those people, to go and find out what makes them happy and to arrive in England having done a cross-section of the world and find out what it is that gives people that happiness. We've got a new website, The Best Life in the World, so it's bestlifeintheworld.com. There's a Facebook page. And over the next 10 months, there's a live tracking map so you can see where the Land Rover's got to. You can see if we actually make it through Pakistan and Iran. They're going to be amazing countries. They're going to be beautiful countries, amazing people. But follow us. Get on the adventure. And if you've been to any of these countries, we want to crowdsource information. This is what Twitter allows you to do. Have a voice and have a conversation. So if you've been to some countries and you remember this guy that was stood on the edge of the, uh, the, edge of the street, selling hot nuts, had a smile on his face and loved life. Tell us about those people. We want to find the happiest people and the best places and what gives people that quality of life. I'd love you to come along for the ride. There's spaces in the Land Rover, two in the back. If you need to come along for an adventure and get out of this country, then come do it. So what happened in life for me? I started off as someone who loved adventure. I went to South Africa, I had a quick adventure. I then came back to England and became an island caretaker, which is very bizarre. I then started working with Tourism Queensland and flew business class for the first time. Pfft, won't happen again. Tourism ambassador, oh my God. And then I started to do social media and use it to sell a story and sell adventure. I had a tweet yesterday, genuine, from a little boy called Lucas. He said, I'm gonna I should read it to you. He says, I'm 13 years old and I want to be an adventurer. How do I start off in life? And that makes me feel so good because there's people out there that might not get their engineering degree that want to have this vision in life. So I replied to him and said, you need to follow this adventure. You need to come along and join us at some point. And he lives in England, so we'll probably meet up with little Lucas. 
to try and give them a bit of inspiration. But that's what social media allows you to do. Have the stories with these people. So during my expeditions, I use social media to take people along for the journey and inspire them to get outdoors and explore the world. Tourism organisations adore this part of it. Cinemad, which is my videography business and my film company, is a creative outlet that helps tourism companies better represent themselves online. And my wife and Bradley, my accountant, love this because it brings in money and it funds the adventures. So when you get to that moment in life and you decide if you can go because your friend's blown you out or if you think, we'll just go for the safe holiday, we'll just go and sit in a sun lounger, think about the challenge every day and taking the road less travelled because genuinely it works out well and you can have a whole lifetime of experiences on this amazing place called planet Earth. There's Colonel Mustard. There's where you need to go. Follow the adventure, the best life in the world. Thank you.